Ja, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, herzlich willkommen hier bei uns am Zeitstand auf der Frankfurter Buchmesse. Ich freue mich sehr, dass Sie hier sind. Mein Name ist Peter Neumann, ich bin Redakteur im Feuilleton der Zeit und ich habe heute die Ehre und die große Freude, ein Gespräch mit Omri Böhm zu führen über sein neues Buch Radikaler Universalismus jenseits von Identität und wir wollen uns also darüber unterhalten, was macht den Universalismus so radikal? Ein ganz kurzes Wort zu Omri Böhm, bevor wir ins Gespräch einsteigen. Omri Böhm, Philosoph, Jahrgang 1979, geboren in Haifa. Er ist Associate Professor an der New School for Social Research in New York, hat sich akademisch viel mit Kant und Spinoza beschäftigt. Das ist für das Buch und das Projekt eines Universalismus nicht ganz unwichtig und äh, tritt seit einigen Jahren aber verstärkt und sehr prominent eben auch als öffentlicher Intellektueller in Erscheinung. Und für mich ist sozusagen Henri Böhm eigentlich ein Intellektueller, wie ich mir ihn vorbildlicher nicht vorstellen könnte. Sein letztes Buch 2020 ähm, erschienen, hieß Israel eine Utopie, in dem er sich für eine binationale Lösung anstelle von der viel diskutierten Zwei-Staaten-Lösung aussprach. Auch das spielt in diesem Buch eine, eine große Rolle. Und jetzt wollen wir einfach einsteigen, lieber Omri Böhm, äh, schön, dass Sie da sind, äh, aus New York, gestern eingetroffen. Mhm. Ähm, Radikaler Universalismus heißt das Buch, ich fange beim Titel gleich an, Universalismus, also die Vorstellung, dass bestimmte Rechte für ausnahmslos alle Menschen gelten, unabhängig von Hautfarbe, von Geschlecht, von Religion, von Staatsangehörigkeit. Diese Form von Universalismus ist ja eigentlich per se radikal, weil sie immer Anspruch auf eine Allgemeingültigkeit erhebt, weil sie eigentlich immer aufs Ganze geht. Meine erste Frage, was macht Ihren Universalismus so radikal? Anderer, anders vielleicht als andere Universalismen, die es da auch noch gibt. Yeah. Great question. Um, um, you know, my, um, my research assistant told me when uh, we were, she was helping me with a book, she said, now that I understand your position, I understand that the title of the book is actually redundant. Um, you shouldn't be, co uh, be calling your book radical universalism, you should just call your book universalism. Um, because if I understand you correctly, you think that all universalism is um, as such radical. And I think that um, she was exactly right. I can justify why the title is still not redundant. Um, if it had been redundant, I would have taken it out, but we can say a word about this in a moment. Um, I think you're right. All universalism is radical. I think that um, the Auseinandersetzung is not between radical and moderate universalism, mm -hmm. but between universalism or true universalism and false universalism. Not even yet identity or something like that. Um, what I wanted to capture with, um, with a title was a thought that a lot of the people who claim to be universalistic or universalists these days are not. So the real Auseinandersetzung in the book is not between moderate universalists and radical universalists, but between true universalists and false universalists. And I wanted to especially accuse, let's say, or criticize, yeah. to be more friendly, uh, to criticize those who argue in the name of we liberalism, mm -hmm. wir liberalismus, um, that they claim that they argue against identity politics. I wanted to say no you're actually doing identity politics yourself, universalism cannot go back to the we. A word about why this is still called radical. Mm -hmm. It is because the book thinks that, or tries to argue, that in order to defend the true universalism, you need to understand its origins. Mm -hmm. You need to understand its radix, so to speak. Um, so we go back to the beginning of universalism in order to understand it properly and defend true universalism as opposed to fake universalism. Dann würde ich da gerne gleich äh, weiter fragen wollen, wo sind denn diese Ursprünge des ähm, Universalismus zu finden? Denn wenn ich dich richtig verstehe, geht es ja jetzt nicht nur darum, einen äh, falschen Universalismus von einem, ähm, von einem wahren, radikalen Universalismus zu trennen, sondern eben auch zu behaupten, dass überhaupt erst der radikale Univers Universalismus die Bedingung dafür ist, 
Ungerechtigkeit kompromisslos gewissermaßen bekämpfen und dagegen angehen zu können. Also wo liegen oder wo sind sozusagen in deiner Geschichte, wo liegen die, diese Quellen, die du anzapfen möchtest? Für well, my, my, um, um, the origins that I uh, locate in the book, I think they are the um, origins of what I understand by universalism, they are in two maybe surprising um, um, texts or traditions. One of them is a tradition of biblical prophecy. Mm -hmm. I think that the Jewish prophets um, understood the original idea of what universalism was. I can say in a moment what that is. And then I try to show that Immanuel Kant, um, um, unlike many others in the Enlightenment, were trying to formulate in modern terms um, that original uh, thought that was captured by um, the Jewish prophets. What was that thought? Kannst du das darstellen? Ja, gerne. That thought was, um, I think, the idea of humanity. The idea that human beings as such are um, um, the origin of norms and that they do not receive it from other authorities. You can see this um, first in um, the relation of the Jewish prophets to the state. Mm -hmm. um, the prophets were always the ones who denied the authority of the state in the name of the authority of justice that already showed you how human beings have the power and the authority to oppose external authorities. And as I try to show in the book, this is now becoming very specific, um, it becomes really um, a radical thesis when um, the prophets can also overcome the authority of God and not just of states, of kings, of kingdoms and so forth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Darf ich ganz kurz ähm, danach haken, also weil diese Verbindung zwischen, ähm, zwischen einer kantischen Mo Moralphilosophie und sozusagen dem jüdischen Prophetentum vielleicht jetzt überhaupt nicht auf der Hand liegt, sondern total überraschend ist in dieser Weise, ähm, könntest du das vielleicht einfach nochmal ähm, darstellen, wo dort die Verbindung äh, zwischen beiden ja. Ähm, well, um, liegt. Wenn, wenn wir an Kant denken, denken wir vielleicht an die allgemeine Erklärung der Menschenrechte 1946 oder an die amerikanische Unabhängigkeitserklärung, also all das, aber wir denken erstmal nicht an Propheten, die daherkommen. Und, äh one interesting, um, uh, it's not something that I discovered with this book, yeah. but one interesting fact that is not often noticed, this is now um, also not noticed necessarily among scholars, is that it's interesting that the greatest Kant expert of all times, Hermann Cohen, was actually someone who already noticed that. That the, what Kant is doing is re-articulating um, uh, this original prophetic idea. Look, I think that um, the main question to ask is, how do we understand in modern terms mm -hmm. the idea that um, there's a certain law, there's a certain concept of justice mm -hmm. that is not created by human beings, it is not reduced to what human beings agree about in a democracy. It is not reduced to uh, consensus. It is not reduced to common norms of uh, what we think. And it's not also reduced to a certain law that was given to us from God, but rather a certain law that is just true and we actually can know it, mm -hmm. follow it, even obey it, that becomes um, complicated. The question how to formulate such a law was a question that confronted Kant. And um, that is a sense in which he's reviving, let's say, um, um, a certain prophetic tradition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Ähm, einen Gedanken, den ich sehr spannend fand, ähm, auch eine Überraschung in dem Buch, ähm, du sagst so sozusagen sinngemäß, man müsse jetzt eigentlich den Universalismus vor der Aufklärung retten, weil ja. du, ähm, glaube ich, den Verdacht hast ähm, und auch so wenn wir die Aufklärung in ihrer historischen Genese verfolgen, ähm, dass die Aufklärung eigentlich nicht ihr Versprechen das hält, right. das sie gegeben ähm, right. hat. Und ähm, auch da würde man ja sagen, eigentlich ja Universalismus und Aufklärung, das klingt erstmal nach demselben, ist aber nicht dasselbe und du versuchst genau das auch zu sagen. Ich denke, das ist eigentlich einer der most wichtigsten Punkte, yeah. dass um, wir oft denken, dass Universalism oder dass die Enlightenment defended, if not invented Universalism. Um, And a lot of the debates today, whether we are to uh, defend the Enlightenment from its identity critics or um, whether we should attack the Enlightenment because um, it is universalistic, those positions, what we often perceive as uh, two rival positions, the identity politicians on the one side, 
who are against enlightenment and the defenders of enlightenment, um, the alleged defenders of enlightenment. On the other side, I, th I think they share in common a misunderstanding of what enlightenment was. Mm -hmm. Enlightenment in a way was the greatest enemy of universalism because it had the tendency to reduce the idea of humanity to nature. Mm -hmm. It had the tendency to make human beings just objects in nature. And if human beings are just objects in nature, then they can be possessed, controlled, and mastered. They can be enslaved in a certain way. To that extent, and now we can see that this is already very near to, uh, let's say, left um, uh, enlightenment critique, that is something that Kant understood already, that if you objectify human beings as part of nature, like the enlightenment has a tendency to do, then the enlightenment undermines the concept of humanity and thereby universalism. What I try to show in the book is that what Kant attempts to do is to criticize this positivistic uh, tendency of enlightenment in the name of enlightenment. Right? Mm -hmm. He's trying to save enlightenment, so to speak, from itself. Mm -hmm. This is also mm -hmm. why I think he's so important today when we're having, those, um, when we're having this Auseinandersetzung between um, the anti-enlightenment people and the enlightenment people. Um, maybe we are having this debate on the wrong terms because we haven't quite understood what enlightenment is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I think Kant can help us understand that debate better. Okay, also du würdest sagen, dass, da, dass es gewissermaßen von, jetzt sozusagen von linker identitätspolitischer Seite, also heutzutage eben Angriffe auf dieses große Projekt der Aufklärung gibt, im Sinne von, die Aufklärung ist eben das gewesen, was am Ende eben doch ein Projekt einer weißen europäischen westlichen Herrschaft gewesen ist, die kolonialisiert hat, die all diese Dinge getan hat, die auch in den letzten fünf bis zehn Jahren noch mal auch Gegenstand ähm, wirklich strittiger öffentlicher Debatten äh, geworden sind. Aber auch auf der rechten Seite sehen wir eine ähnliche Bewegung der identitätspolitischen Vereinnahmung eines, ähm, einer, eines Konsenses, einer Konformität, einer... Ähm There are, um, there are two positions here, but the most interesting is yeah. the third one allegedly in the middle. In the middle. Yeah. One position is of the progressive left that's arguing with identity, race, gender, mm -hmm. was auch immer. You have the right which argues mostly in terms of the nation. And I think mo usually in Germany when you say this, people know and they know it's dangerous. That's the right-wing identity politics. The main target of my book, or one of the main targets of my book, is actually to show the alleged liberals in the middle who say, we criticize the left and the right, in the name of universalism, are also not universalists. Mm -hmm. Because what we call um, the universalism of liberalism has become an empty shell. They have given up on the robust idea of humanity as um, an absolute notion, that idea that came also, say, from the Jewish prophets. Mm -hmm. And they have given up on it um, and replaced it with a notion of the we, We Germans, we Israelis, uh -huh. we Americans. Uh -huh. Only that whenever you say we, all of us Germans, you immediately um, um, exclude, and in a rather violent way, those who do not belong to the we. The fact is, we is never a universal term. It cannot uh -huh. be uh -huh. a universal term. Um, so the question of universalism is the question whether we can articulate our politics, from a perspective that is not um, emerging out of a we, that does not begin from a we. Aber ganz direkt gefragt, wie ist das möglich? Weil wir sind ja alle in unseren we's gewissermaßen äh, gefangen, ähm, wir sind alle sozusagen Angehöriger, Angehörige bestimmter sozusagen Sprecherpositionen etc. pp. Also, äh, wie kommen wir da auch raus? Weil das ist ja genau das, was du forderst, wenn man sagt, wir brauchen sozusagen diese Idee einer allgemeinen Menschheit wieder, um all diese Dinge überhaupt kritisieren um, zu können. Look, I'll give you an answer that I think most people here will not be able to, under, uh, to understand, not, not be, because it's very, very far-fetched. We need a prophet. <laughs> we need to follow someone who can um, challenge the ways that we mm -hmm. think. But this is now too far-fetched. This will okay. require an academic conversation. Um, I think that the question is good. I think that the assumption that this is impossible mm -hmm. is already a bad ideology. Okay. I, I agree very much that the question, 
how can we overcome our own identity? How can I speak, not as an Israeli, not as a, a white, not as a man, not as a professor, father, husband, was auch immer, can I speak as a human being? Can I speak um, from a universal perspective? This is a huge challenge. It is especially a challenge because no language is universal. And um, uh, for that reason, when I speak, I'm already not speaking from a universal perspective. The assumption that this is impossible is the ideology that's actually joined or common to the liberal center, uh -huh. the identitarian left, and the identitarian right. Uh -huh. How can we do that? For example, by the demand that when we think to ourselves, we think in public. So I say what I think from my perspective as, let's say, an Israeli Jew. And you say what you think as, uh, let's say, uh, a, a German. Others would say what they say as Palestinians. The question whether this debate um, can actually create a universal perspective, that the debate itself would be universal, um, is a question haunting the book. Mm -hmm. Wenn man deine ähm, Theorie ähm, des Universalismus oder dieses radikalen Universalismus eine, als eine dezidiert politische Theorie äh, liest, dann könnte man sie einerseits eben, also so wie wir es jetzt auch eben sagen, ähm, geschildert haben, so als eine bestimmte Art und Weise, sich eben äh, radikal auf ähm, liberale Demokratien zu beziehen und sie zu kritisieren, ähm, auch in ihren Automatismen oder an den Stellen, an denen sie nicht funktionieren, ähm, eventuell. Man kann es aber auch tatsächlich als eine Theorie des zivilen Ungehorsams ähm, äh, interpretieren. Also dieser Ungehorsam ist ein, ähm, ein, ein Begriff, der mir bei der Lektüre aufgefallen ist. Ich ähm, mag einen Satz zitieren. Du schreibst an einer Stelle, der absoluten Pflicht zu folgen. Ja, Pflicht ist ohnehin ein wichtiger Begriff, äh, wenn es um äh, sozusagen die innere Pflicht zu handeln, der absoluten Pflicht zu folgen, schreibst du, ist der Ursprung nicht des Gehorsams, sondern des Ungehorsams. Right. Und danach würde ich dich noch gerne fragen, ob sich da nicht eigentlich auch so eine Theorie zivilen Ungehorsams oder überhaupt Ungehorsams ähm, Absolut. Um, yeah. I mean, in one way to see what I'm trying to do in the book is to um, save um, um, a certain abolitionist uh, position. The abolitionists in the, in the United States were the ones who um, argued against slavery, but did not believe that you have to follow the rule of law in order to fight uh, slavery, right? So you had um, this debate in the United States um, befe before the Civil War between the Unionists. They were, let's say, our we liberals. They were the ones who opposed slavery, but thought that in the end we need to uh, keep the rule of law and uh, we need to argue about it democratically. Um, if states decide democratically that there is um, uh, slavery, then that might be also a legitimate decision, in any case, not one that has to be abolished. The abolitionists were the ones who argued the rule of law um, can go to hell when it comes to the question of slavery. Mm. We can also take the law into our own hands. I'm asking the question, sorry, I'm asking the question of the possibility of that statement today. For the abolitionists, this was, um, this relied on religion. Um, that is because they were um, religious, even call them fanatics, that they thought, they believed in hell And they thought that if you um, have slaves, you go to hell. You have to fight against that. Of course, we don't think in those terms today, most of us, I hope. Can we recover abolitionist politics in modern terms? And I think that the answer to that is Kant. Mm -hmm. To go back now to your question. Liberal democracy, I mean, there are, two, there are two different types of authorities that um, we have a relation to. One is a relation to uh, totalitarian regimes. And um, that is somehow an easy question. All good people here know that when there is a tota totalitarian regime, um, responsible people have to oppose it if they can. Okay, that's easy. The difficult question that also promotes um, so-called identity politics is the fact that in liberal democracies, legitimacy comes from the people. And the law, even though it can be unjust, is legitimate. There is a certain um, 
Spaltung, or even worse than Spaltung, there is a certain conflict mm -hmm. between justice and legitimacy. Mm -hmm. Legitimate laws decided by the procedures of liberal democracy can be unjust. The question is, by what right can we take the rule of law also to our own hands, if we have to, in order to um, fight injustice? And my answer is, only if you follow a certain absolute law of justice, can you disobey not just a totalitarian regime, but also what is considered the rule of law, what is considered a legitimate um, um, consensus? Mm -hmm. Das, was gewissermaßen gerade gesetztes Recht ist, oder das, was sich vielleicht auch in einer Mehrheitsgesellschaft als Konsensus gerade herausgebildet hat, ist das was? To try to make this even more concrete, because yeah. this is now, I mean, this is not a philosophy seminar here. Um, Why is it the case that only if I obey an absolute law can I be disobedient? The answer is, the question is a question of disobedient, disobedience to man-made laws and my ability to disobey man-made laws. If I take the law into my own hands, I have to ask myself, by what right? Am I just a fanatic? Or I can actually claim that I follow an idea of justice. Uh -huh. My argument in the book is that the radical tradition of the Enlightenment, as someone like Kant understood it, would actually affirm the question, the answer to that question. Whereas the whole of liberal thinking as we know it today really consists in denying it. Also wenn ich dich richtig verstanden habe oder so, glaube ich, steht es auch in dem Buch, sagst du, dass, ähm, dass das Gesetz dem dem inneren moralischen Gesetz, von dem Kant sagt, wir müssen ihm folgen, dass das selbst noch ein Gesetz ist, dem Gott unterliegen würde. Uh, not God. Yeah. For, uh, let's leave God um, yeah. out of the picture for a moment, even though we can return to God later if we have mm. time in our short 30 minutes. But um, um, not God. But the point is this. The authority, also when I obey the law in a liberal democracy, I never obey it because of the authority of law. In a certain way, I hope uh, people here will quote me on that uh, broadly, in a certain way, Kant, correctly understood, is an anarchist. Uh, for Kant experts, this will sound completely crazy. In a certain way, Kant is an anarchist. Not because he wouldn't say that you shouldn't obey the law, but it's never the authority of the law that you obey. It's the authority of justice. This means that to the extent that you have um, a reason um, to obey the law because it's just to obey it, you obey the law because it's just. This also means that there's a certain limit and that at some point when the law itself becomes antagonistic to justice, not just unjust, mm -hmm. but an offense against the very idea of justice, you actually have the right of revolution. And the right of revolution is very much the question, say, if we want to um, ask the question about the Declaration of Independence of the United States. People remember the, uh, the statement that opens it. We hold this truth to um, be self-evident, that all men are created equal. A lot of people today are going against that declaration. They forget that that declaration ends with asserting the right of revolution. Uh -huh. Why is it that according to the Declaration of Independence, we have the right of revolution? It is precisely because it is not the authority of law itself uh -huh. or the Constitution that matters, but truth that all men are created equal. Ähm, Nochmal ganz an den Anfang zurückgefragt, was hat dich eigentlich dazu gebracht, dieses Buch über radikalen Universalismus zu schreiben, weil man könnte sagen, es ist wirklich das Buch der Stunde auch in sozusagen politischer, also auch Welt, weltpolitischer ähm, Lage. Wir sehen den Universalismus überall gerade in Gefahr. Ähm, ist es etwas, was dich beim Schreiben auch umgetrieben ähm, hat? Also diese Art von, ja, es gab jetzt irgendwie diese Führungsmachtrede von Lars Klingbeil etc. pp., wo er von verschiedenen Zentren gesprochen hat. Ähm, also sozusagen, wir leben in einer multipolaren Welt und multipolar hört sich eigentlich schon sehr re relativ an und muss natürlich sozusagen einen Universalisten wie dich schon wieder aufschrecken. Also wie, wie nimmst du das wahr gerade? Auch deine eigene, sozusagen jetzt theoretische I mean, Position uh, innerhalb dieser Gemengelage. Look, I mean, you mentioned this before. Yeah. For me, the question here was present in my, let's say, academic work always. Yeah. 
my previous uh, book, um, very academic, was on Kant and Spinoza, and this had everything to do with this. A, a, a four, um, an earlier book was about the binding of Isaac, so mm -hmm. those things were always there. Um, you know, I teach in the United States, I teach in New York, and I see my students as going completely against the concept of um, um, universalism. Mm -hmm. They see universalism as the enemy. On the other hand, I come from Israel, where um, uh, also a certain form of identity politics um, informs, um, uh, uh, um, let's say, our crisis, right? Because Zionism is identity politics. People sometimes forget it. And it's identity politics um, um, that um, is based on the exact same logic um, of, of what we call today identity politics, right? Um, liberal democracy did not defend us. Uh, did not defend our rights, did not defend our lives. So we need our own politics. It's an identity politics that's legitimate if there ever was any. Mm. But I still think that also with Zionism we see the limits of that position. The fact that um, if you start with identity, you actually cannot defend rights. Um, identity matters, but it matters because it is identity of human beings. I was interested in the question of defending the concept of humanity mm -hmm. as prior to politics than the concept of identity. Um, that, that was basically the anregung uh, or the, uh, what prompted me to write the book. Ähm, letzte Frage an dich, lieber Omri, dann äh, sind auch schon diese 30 Minuten ähm, vorbei. Ich habe eingangs auch gesagt, dass äh, du als öffentlicher Intellektueller immer stärker in Erscheinung trittst und auch in der deutschen, aber nicht nur in der deutschen Öffentlichkeit auch so wahrgenommen wirst. Ähm, der Begriff des öffentlichen Intellektuellen ist auch zu einer unzeitgemäßen äh, Person oder Figur geworden, weil eigentlich den öffentlichen Intellektuellen der genau das Problem hat, was du auch in deinem, deinem Buch beschreibst, nämlich er ist da und muss sich zu Dingen äußern, von denen er eventuell nur... Ähm, äh, von denen er eventuell gar nicht betroffen ist oder auch gar nicht so viel Ahnung hat. Ähm, und ich wollte dich fragen, wie siehst du dich selbst? Siehst du, siehst du dich selbst als öffentlichen Intellektuellen? Und wenn du, hast du einen positiven Begriff von diesem Intellektuellen und was würde ihn für dich auszeichnen? Hard for me to say. I mean, it's true that I write more and more publicly yeah. also, but, I, and this is clear in this book, but I try and... Uh, It's not too popular. Um, um, das wollte ich nicht sagen. No, no, I know. I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't suspect. <laughs> For me, this is going from both directions. On the one hand, I feel a certain duty to write publicly, mm -hmm. because I think those things are important to the public. On the other hand, I have been, I cannot pretend that I, I, I have been also unhappy with some of the trends that I see in academic philosophy, um, which is often very sophisticated and impressive but has a, a little bit lost touch with what matters, not just with what sells, not just with how many people would read you, but with um, something that it genuinely matters. And for me, um, this was, um, I'm still, I cannot say that I've successfully done it, but <laughs> I'm still negotiating the grounds um, um, of, um, of that position. I wouldn't call myself a public intellectual in that sense, but I write more and more publicly also because of the... So I want to be challenged by public questions more and more. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually uh, enlightenment in its best way, mm -hmm. best sense. And I also want to challenge the public mm -hmm. um, in a certain way. Um, public intellectuals need the public. Um, they need a public sphere that does not just buy their books or read their newspaper. They, there needs to be a certain atmosphere where debate is still possible. And I fear that we're um, starting to enter, I don't know if an epoch, but um, um, a certain culture uh -huh. where you can no longer speak about um, pub a public sphere in the sense that the Habermas meant it back in the day. Or um, I think capitalism is killing the public sphere. Of course, capitalism was always in a certain exchange with the public sphere. But um, the book market, um, the newspapers, um, they always had to negotiate mm -hmm. the relation to reason. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to write the truth in the mm -hmm. newspaper? What does, um, does the truth sell? And if it wouldn't sell, would it still be published? Und so weiter und so fort. Those questions were always there. The ability of saying the truth in the newspaper has not disappeared. Die Zeit, whatever appears in Die Zeit is true especially when I write, I mean, <laughs> um, 
but I think that the challenges are increasing. And um, that the, que the question of being a public intellectual, this is not a personal question to me, I think uh, will become, um, we will need a different figure than the public intellectual, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and uh, that's disturbing. Yeah, yeah. Das ist ähm, sehr interessant und gibt uns, glaube ich, jetzt noch mal ähm, äh, einiges äh, zu denken. Ich darf mich ganz herzlich bei dir äh, bedanken für diesen ähm, kurzen Talk. Ich darf mich bei Ihnen bedanken fürs äh, Zuhören, fürs Mitdenken. Ich kann Ihnen wirklich nur her wärmstens an her ans Herz legen, dieses Buch zu lesen, ähm, äh, langsam zu lesen, schnell zu lesen, zweimal zu lesen. Äh, Omri Böhm, vielen Dank, Thanks dass du da much. warst. Yeah. Thank you.